first had a conversation with you in April of last year as the pandemic was just setting in. So as to reflect on this past year, what just in general would you like to share about where we've been and where we're going in respect to the pandemic? And I have lots more questions, but let's start with that one. Well, I think uh, my, you know, I have a lot of reflections as you might imagine. Uh, they touch upon uh, K-12 education, higher ed, healthcare delivery, uh, research, science, uh, et cetera. But I guess in some, I would say, uh, just focusing on the UNO and the Med Center campuses, it's a tremendous sense of pride, gratitude, admiration for the faculty and staff and students who worked so hard to continue our journey, whether it's in the educational mission, the research mission, in the clinical care or the community engagement missions. We've done so much together and we've not interrupted that journey. Sure, we've done things differently, but we've focused on the health and well being of our faculty, students, and staff. We focused on maintaining their academic journey and staying true to the mission of our campuses. And uh, I'm really, really proud of that. We could unpack that forever, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that's what I will remember most about this last year. Okay, very good. So talk to us a little bit about the recent graduations that happened at both UNO and at UNMC. Talk about the number of graduates and how did those ceremonies go and how are we able to pull that off in terms of bringing students together and their families in person for this milestone? Well, you know, going into this, there was always the debate, uh, should we do these in person? Should we do these virtually? But I can tell you, I spent hours of time uh, with our graduating or soon to be graduating students at UNO and at the Med Center, and they wanted an in-person event. Even if it was for a very small number of family members and guests, they wanted that moment in time to create that memory. You know, granted, they also wanted the photo ops, they of course wanted their diplomas, but they wanted to be able to celebrate this. And so we rolled up our sleeves at the Med Center and at UNO and said, okay, how can we do this? Six events at UNMC statewide, uh, seven events uh, at Baxter Arena uh, for UNO, 1,671 graduates for UNO, 1,051 graduates uh, from the Med Center, uh, received their diplomas, celebrated with their families, and we had safe, thoughtful, uh, very engaged, very personal events, delivered honorary degrees uh, at both campuses to remarkable people, including General uh, Hyten at UNO and Dr. Mobley at uh, UNMC, uh, Order of the Tower Awards and J.G. Elliott Awards uh, at UNO and UNMC, uh, uh, respectively. We did all the things that we would typically do in a spring commencement ceremony but we did it in a way that was safe. Uh, and I'm not aware of any, and I mean any case transmission that has resulted from these events. Uh, and we've been tracking that really carefully. Indeed, actually the campus numbers for faculty, staff and students and community numbers have actually continued to go down since these commencement events has occurred. So, I mean, the last thing we wanted to do was to give out diplomas and host a super spreader event, right? And so uh, uh, we were successful in giving out the diplomas and honoring, and honoring our graduates, but we did not honor the course of the virus transmission. So with that said, maybe transition a little bit and talk about the vaccinations across the campuses. So has everyone at UNMC and at UNO had the chance to be vaccinated? And what about the students as well? Yeah, so it's easier to talk about the Med Center first. So let's start there. The, uh, uh, we, uh, after the first wave of immunizations at the Med Center, which actually started in late December, just as uh, immediately upon receiving the emergency use authorization for the, <clears throat> initially the Pfizer product and the Moderna product, uh, we uh, immunized, 85.6% uh, of all faculty, students, and staff. Actually, uh, over time, that number has risen into the low 90s. And so uh, these are people who voluntarily showed up, rolled up their sleeves, and they all said, me first, 
uh, and they lined up and they got immunized. Uh, similarly, just as soon as we could, uh, working very closely with the uh, Douglas County Health Department, in particular, Dr. Adi Poor, who's been a fabulous partner in this under the leadership of Dr. Jane Meza uh, on the uh, UNL campus, made the vaccines available through various clinics uh, and other opportunities, you know, think pharmacies, mass vaccine centers, et cetera, to faculty and staff, and of course, uh, to anybody over the age, initially over 16. Uh, and as you probably now know, uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration has broadened the Pfizer products uh, accessibility to now individuals over 12. And so we've continued to try to make those opportunities available. But right now we're in a situation in Douglas County and uh, Omaha Metro, and frankly, statewide and nationally, where we have more vaccine than we can administer. Indeed, that's why the uh, uh, federal government is giving some very serious thought about what we can do to help the people in other parts of the world, which is critically important to us. Because if we can't control the transmission and the development of viral variants, so-called VOCs or variants of concerns in India, in Europe, in Africa, in uh, South America, we're never gonna control the virus in the United States because of the global transmission of this, uh, of this virus or any pandemic for uh, that matter. Uh, and so uh, now really it comes down to dealing with this very delicate balance of so-called vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy, you know, falls into three different categories, if you don't mind my addressing it for a minute, if, if that's okay, Catherine. Uh, <clears throat> there's one category of individuals that don't believe in any vaccines. They've never been vaccinated. They never get their families vaccinated, and they're certainly not going to deviate now. Uh, there's another category, which fortunately is the largest category that says, you know, when it's convenient, I'll do it. I'm really busy uh, or I'm waiting for more experience with these vaccines because they were developed very quickly. Or, uh, you know, I have a friend that had a, you know, bad headache or a little fever or something. And I may not want to do that now, but when I get a little more time free, I might do it. And that, that's the group that we're mostly focused on the convenience, what I call group, or the group where education and experience is going to mean something uh, to them. And then there's the final group, albeit small, very vocal, that says, you know, COVID doesn't exist, so why would I want to get vaccinated uh, for something that doesn't uh, exist? And, and there's an opportunity for education as well, because, you know, speaking about Nebraska, there's no community, large or small in the state, that has not been touched by this pandemic that has not seen tragically hospitalization and death. And particularly now with these uh, much more concerning variants, we're seeing much younger people being hospitalized. We're seeing hospitalization of children, actually infants worldwide with some of these new strains that have been identified. And so the, the rush is on here. Now Nebraska has done extremely well. We are over 50% immunized uh, of the over 16 year old population. And by the way, for those of you that track our websites, uh, the state starting tomorrow is going to report the total population, not just those over 16. So you might see the percentages drop a bit because now we want to of course include the 12 year olds and older. And hopefully by late summer, we'll be able to include the two year olds uh, and older. But again, just you know, holding forth for a second, these are safe, very effective vaccines and all of the improvement that we've had. You know, think about it, in mid-January, we had 125 cases per 100,000 per day in the state of Nebraska. We had 3.23 yesterday, you know, dramatic change. The only thing that's influenced that has been vaccination. Encouraging numbers. So I believe it was last week was when the CDC revised their guidelines related to gatherings and related to masking. Can you just address that a little bit? I know there's some people asking questions either about still wearing a mask or is, are people going to follow those guidelines? Can you just maybe address that a little bit from your perspective? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of people have said, and it even felt to us uh, initially to be a very abrupt decision uh, by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But as it got unpacked uh, later by Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci and others, 
uh, it turns out there was a lot of science that went into it. Uh, at the science uh, had to do with one, the vaccine breakthrough rates and the, which of course is the percentage of individuals who are fully vaccinated, who then go on to get infected <clears throat> with the variants of concern, not just the wild strain virus. And also some very encouraging data from Europe uh, that was looking at the ability of an individual who is fully vaccinated with any of these vaccines we're talking about here to actually transmit the virus to others. So the vaccine breakthrough rates, very low, and the transmission rates of fully vaccinated individuals to others, again, fully very low, and also uh, hitting a relative plateau in the acceptance of vaccines in many parts of the, of the United States uh, with uh, you know, an adequate amount of supply. Early on, we were supply limited. Now we're demand limited. And so the question I'm sure came up is what could be done to message those that may have had some hesitancy or been on the fence, uh, what could you do to help them get back their normal life? And one of them would be to, of course, be able to gather with others, to be inside and outside with others, which was changed policy-wise a long time ago, you know, recommendation-wise. And then now, most recently, to be able to do that in fully vaccinated groups without masks. And, uh, you know, and you think about it, you know, we're a very social society. One of the things that we love to do with our friends and families is break bread, you know, uh, have a beverage of your choice. And I'll leave it to your imagination what that might be. But, you know, we gather socially, particularly around holidays, including the holiday weekend coming up. And these are data supported decisions. But they're not without risk, Catherine. I wanna be really clear about that because we know that as good as the vaccines are, vaccines plus social distancing, vaccines plus masks are better than vaccines without. But the breakthrough rates, the transmission rates are sufficiently low. And I'm hoping you know, that the incentive for others to roll up their sleeve and get their vaccine doses is sufficiently increased by offering these people uh, the privilege of tossing their mask when they're indoors with others who are fully vaccinated. And by the way, you know, I'm very careful to use this phrase fully vaccinated. What I mean by that is people who are more than 14 days out from the last dose of either their two dose vaccines or their single dose uh, vaccines to try to give them back, you know, a, a more normal life. You know, obviously we don't know, you know, about all the people that we're with at any given time. You know, you uh, go to a concert or an athletic event or you go to church everybody takes off their mask you don't know who's vaccinated and who's not and by the way there are some other important considerations in this and that would be that there are individuals there's been some really good data that shows people who are transplant recipients people who are actively being treated for cancer people who are on some of these biologically active drugs like Remicade or Humira or Simzia or Intivio or those uh, biologically active agents have a much lower protective effect from the vaccines. Indeed, the study on Remicade said the vaccines were 22 to 24% effective, not anywhere near the 95 effective uh, in the otherwise uh, larger population that was studied in the clinical trial. And you know, the long and the short of it is uh, when you and I go into a larger group of people, uh, we don't know who's on these medications. We don't know who's had a transplant. We don't know who's being treated for cancer uh, or some advanced form of heart disease or Alzheimer's or whatever. Uh, all we know about is our immediate friends and family. And sometimes we don't even know all of that to be totally truthful. And so that's why, you know, being courteous, being thoughtful, taking care of ourselves, but also taking care of others uh, is important. You know, I, my best advice, Catherine, is when in doubt, continue to wear your mask. While we're down statewide to about 3.2 cases per 100,000, in the Omaha Metro, we're down to about 3.55, uh, 3.6 cases per 100,000. Uh, that can change given the increasing prevalence of the variant uh, that we're seeing from uh, uh, South America, the P1 variant. And that can certainly change given the increasing prevalence of the variant we're seeing from uh, uh, India, which is known as the B1.617 variant, 
which are more transmissible, higher rates of hospitalization, more vaccine breakthrough, and tragically more lethal. The vaccines work, but they don't work as well. And so we need to be aware of that, you know, and, and, uh, and just take what I believe are appropriate uh, precautions, which is to protect ourselves and to protect others. Very good. So let's switch gears just a little bit sure. and let's talk back about UNMC and UNO and let's talk about what fall looks like. So this time of year, students graduate, go on, and then we're of course preparing for what's to come in the fall. So just talk a little bit about what, what that might look like from your perspective. Well, I think the fall of 2021 is gonna look a lot more like the fall of 2019 uh, than it did like the fall of last year. Uh, I think we're going to have many, many more students on campus. <clears throat> so I, you know, I just happened to look at enrollment data for UNO earlier today. Uh, <clears throat> on campus classes enrollment way up. Online enrollment uh, significantly down and shifting in that direction, which is great. Uh, I think we're going to have many more students in our res halls. I think we're going to have many more uh, attended conferences, symposia, athletic events, and things like that. You know, will we, back, will we be back completely to normal? You know, I think there's a mile of time, you know, a mile of distance between now and when, uh, you know, late August occurs, and we need to make those decisions. But if you look at the trends that we've been seeing over the last month, the effects of these vaccines, uh, I think uh, the, the, all the predictors are moving in the right direction. But you know, uh, you know I, as I'm fond of saying, the only thing we know for sure about this pandemic is that it's not gonna be the last one. And so uh, whether we're gonna be dealing with more variants, whether there's gonna be increased case transmission, whether we're gonna have to rethink some of our planning for the fall, hard to know for sure. But we are planning to have a you know, fully or nearly fully on-campus experience at both the Med Center uh, and at UNO. Now, uh, having said all of that, uh, the Med Center, uh, although we did do some work from home for a period of time uh, for those who could, and we did do some learning from home or from off-campus sites, uh, we did an awful lot on campus. And that's because, you know, if you're going to a med school or a nursing school or pharmacy, a, a lot of what uh, happens in your instructional pathway happens uh, in the clinical learning environment. And you can't quite, you know, you know, coming back to my previous life as a cardiac surgeon, it's very difficult to teach heart surgery uh, on the computer. You can teach the principles of it, but when you're actually learning the craft, the art and the science of it, you really need to be in the operating theater, in the clinic, uh, practicing uh, your, your learned craft. So, you know, advanced simulation has got, taken us a long way and we've had tens of thousands of learning events uh, in the Davis Global Center. And, you know, and I'm very proud of what Dr. Boyers and her team have done. But I think we're gonna have a, a much closer to what, let's put it this in, in air quotes, normal uh, fall semester. Was there anything that was learned from the pandemic in terms of education about pieces of degree programs that can be done electronically? I mean, any, any surprises that may be carried forward, maybe they weren't intended to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I think there are a lot. I mean, we've learned a lot about people working from home, teaching from home, participating actively in research and discovery and creative activities uh, from home. And we are going to really, we have already begun to rethink our facilities planning, specifically around questions of, uh, for instance, uh, you know, does everybody need a, a room with a desk and a computer? Or what about hoteling for people that, you know, come in one day a week or two days a week, or maybe they need a you know, heaven forbid, a cubicle or, or something uh, along those lines. Uh, we've learned a lot about what we about what types of instructional modalities work best. We know that uh, interactive learning, adaptive learning, uh, learning using augmented and virtual reality are very powerful tools. And we've also learned 
frankly, what didn't work. We have learned a lot from our students that there were certain types of uh, undergraduate and graduate curriculum that they really want the mentorship and the camaraderie of being with their colleagues and being with their faculty and having that experience. And so, yeah, you know, a, a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses. On the scientific side, we've learned an awful lot about, for instance, just let's talk about the production of these vaccines. Uh, th what we've learned uh, about vaccine development uh, and how to scale that and possibly apply that to heart disease, cancer, uh, you know, degenerative neurologic diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and others has been huge. And we're never going to let go of that. Uh, you know, these are all valuable life lessons that have really transformed uh, the health professions. And I think similarly, uh, you know, uh, I'm really very proud, for instance, of our athletic programs at UNO that have been able to keep our student athletes engaged, uh, both academically. And by the way, I looked at the academic performance numbers today uh, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Maverick Athletics, spectacular performance in spite of the pandemic. And at the same time, great performance on the field and on the ice and, uh, you know, under the lights. You know, we went through the hockey pod, for instance. We didn't have a single confirmed case of COVID uh, for the first part of the entire uh, NCHC hockey season. You know, I don't think there's a single athletic conference uh, that could boast that statistic and still have hosted those games in a pod-like uh, environment. And it, you know, so these are tremendous points of pride, lessons learned. You know, and don't also, you shouldn't lose track of the fact that we almost essentially eliminated influenza last season. Wouldn't it be nice if we could never see another flu case again for our families and our kids? So, you know, we need to grasp onto those things and at the same time, be very realistic about what didn't work and try to bring as much of that back to normal. Okay. Go Mavs, right? Go Mavs, right. So talk a little bit, if you will, about what is the biggest building project going on on each of the campuses. So I know there's lots of growth going on, but if you could pick just one from the UNO side, one from the UNMC side and talk a little bit about what's coming. Yeah, so obviously the biggest, meaning most square feet uh, on the UNO campus, uh, that is the extension to Mammal Hall, the Roden uh, Center. Uh, it is magnificent. It's gonna be the new home for Dr. Ligon and the Insight program. It is absolutely phenomenal space. I've toured it on many different occasions, uh, most recently with Congressman Bacon. Uh, it is just uh, absolutely amazing space. But I would be very remiss if I didn't tell the audience how excited I am about a major facelift internally and externally to the Durham Science Buildings, uh, which is, uh, you know, we've already completed the program statement for, all the fundraising is done and that's very exciting. And then just most recently, we presented the program statement for the renovation of Kaiser Hall uh, to become the new home for the uh, Samuel Bach Museum and Academic Learning Center uh, for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and many other academic programs. So very excited about those programs as well. And by the way, a whole bunch of new uh, air handlers uh, repaving broken concrete and tons of other things uh, that have been so important to get done in, in many of our uh, UNO buildings. At the Med Center, uh, you know, and again, in terms of the biggest, it would be the upcoming ribbon cutting at the Monroe Meyer Institute uh, for Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities. Uh, that would be, uh, of course, on Pine Street in Exarban Village, uh, 200 and what, 50, 60,000 square feet of world-class education, clinical and research space. Kudos to Dr. Mernix and his colleagues for the planning of that. But you know, at the same time, the complete renovation of William Science Hall, the complete renovation of the McGugan Library, all the work that's been done uh, with the Wigton Heritage Atrium, which for which we're gonna cut the ribbon in the uh, not so distant future. Uh, all really exciting capital construction projects, uh, you know, baseball, softball on the UNO, uh, campus, for those of you that haven't had a chance to see the Tal Anderson 
baseball field or the Connie Clausen softball field, uh, please take a few minutes, drive by, come to a game. Uh, it's really a magnificent venue. It's one of the very few turf venues uh, in the city, uh, which has got a tremendous appeal, you know, for everybody up to including the College World Series, who are all competing with each other as to who's going to get to practice there, which is, uh, you know, a great uh, combination of events. Uh, hopefully we'll have some Nebraska teams practicing there for the College World Series uh, as well. So uh, all exciting, a lot of great construction projects and a lot more being planned. Okay, so as probably most of our audience knows, you have kind of a big transition coming up, Dr. Gold. So you're gonna be transitioning out of the role of UNO Chancellor. And I wondered if you would maybe just reflect a little bit on that for the alumni and talk about what that's meant to you and how, what are some of the meaningful aspects of that role? And then if you wanna to touch briefly on what's your transition gonna look like, if you wanna share that with us. Sure. Well, I'm really very grateful to have an opportunity to say a few words. This is a very bittersweet moment. Uh, I have spent almost exactly four years in the role of being the chancellor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, you know, I am halfway through my eighth year uh, here at the Med Center. Hard to believe that it was January of 2014 that I became a Nebraskan, and I'm so proud uh, to be a Nebraskan. But it, you know, of all the things I remember most about UNO, and of course, I'm not going far, so let's be really clear about that. Uh, it's the people. It's the alumni, particularly the board and the executive committee of the board, but it's the community. It's our students, faculty and staff. Uh, it's the leadership team, the vice chancellors and the deans that have really meant so much. And these friendships and these relationships are just not going to uh, go away. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned about public metropolitan higher education. I've learned about what does it mean to be a proud anchor institution. I've learned about the underserved uh, communities that the first generation students that we create opportunities for. I've learned about the Thompson Learning Communities and the Goodrich Scholars and the Scott Scholars, and I could go on and on. But these are lifelong lessons that will hopefully empower me in my new role as I become the provost and executive vice president of the NU system. You know, part of me is very excited about that opportunity, Catherine. Part of me is scared to death. Uh, of, I don't know what I don't know. And uh, there's a lot to learn. And, uh, and it's not like remaining in my role as the chancellor of the Med Center and the chair of the Board of Nebraska Medicine is not a very busy time with a lot of things that uh, need to be done. But again, the way it works is by surrounding yourself with the best and the brightest. Uh, make sure that they have what they need to be successful. Always stay the heck out of their way. And then you get to bask in the reflected glory, underscore the word reflected. So again, I'm very uh, pleased the people that I've met in Varner Hall. They're very talented leaders all in their own right. So if I can just make sure they have what they need, stay out of their way, uh, there'll be a lot of glory. <laughs> 